The proposal is to make it then illegal and a criminal offense for you, the seller, to not. I was getting ready to review this article from the CBC, and let me show you what it's got inside. It has a whole bunch of information in regards to what the housing platforms are for each major party in this 2021 Canadian federal election. And the very first line that was most important was the Liberals had not yet released their election platform. And then lucky me, just the next day, good old Justin and his party released their platform. And it just so happens I was preparing for another video all about how the news will skew the real estate facts in order to just tell you whatever it is they want to tell you. So instead of going through someone else's article, like this one from the Financial Post, or even this one from Global, I figured why not go directly to the Liberal Party's website to find out exactly what it is they're saying about their platform. So that's what I'm going to do right now. But really quick, if you could, if you like this type of Canadian real estate information, please subscribe to the channel and make sure to hit the like button. Even if you don't agree with me, hitting the like button or commenting down below will help you to push this information out to other people. And really, in an election, the best thing we can do is get all of the information out to all of the people and then let them make their own choice. So thank you so much for doing that. And now on to reviewing the Liberals' policies. Here we go. Uh, okay, so right from liberal.ca, there's a picture of our buddy Justin. And I'm going to come out and say it right here. Uh, I am one of those people that thinks if you follow a political party like you follow your favorite hockey team, I don't think you're that smart. I think you should weigh all of the, the checks and balances, and I don't think you should vote for the same party every single election, because if you do, you're just following into an ideology and blindly following a leader. That is my political belief. So I think I've just went on record as a flip-flopper, or as I like to call it, uh, you know, educating myself. So here we go. Again, back liberal dot ca, and it took a little bit of digging into because it didn't take me exactly where I wanted to, but here is the housing platform page and you can go to this page yourself liberal.ca slash housing slash a bunch of other stuff all right so they've cleverly chosen the slogan a home period for everyone period the liberal housing plan every canadian deserves a place to call home and for many young people in particular the dream of Owning their home feels like it's moving further out of reach. Now, I do think that most people feel that way and that they're feeling that it's very, very tough. Um, I What I don't like and what I find political parties do is just talk about how you deserve everything without putting in the work yourself. So if you save for a home, I think you deserve a home. Are there things the government can do to make that uh, more obtainable for you? Absolutely. Um, my original thought before reading any of this, and I haven't read any of it, no sort of legislation I've seen yet has made housing more affordable because the legislation is trying to lessen demand rather than increase supply. And I believe it was Benjamin Tal uh, from CIBC, The Economist, that said you cannot fix a supply problem with demand solutions. So let's continue. You shouldn't lose a bidding war on your home to speculators. So what they're saying is if you are an investor, I hear you are less important than a home owner and you shouldn't have to move far away from your job, your school, or your family just to afford your rent. Here's where I don't already like that idea. It's nice to think that we can all live in the most expensive places in the world. However, we can't. Uh, people have to live somewhere near where their income can afford them. Now, there is a detach going on right now between income and housing prices. But if you are going to, let's say, for instance, live in downtown Vancouver and work at a coffee shop, it's going to be hard to pay your rent. You shouldn't just be afforded the richest real estate in the world just because of where you were born. I think you have to earn those things. And, well... Again, that's my opinion, so let's keep going. It's time to change that. All right, so here are the platforms, and look at this. There are lots of them. If I'm counting right, there are 16 comments that they have made, 
and I'm going to walk you through each and every one of them right now. Let's start off with many Canadians need time to build their savings before buying a home. Rent remains one of the largest. Oh my goodness, I see it right here. I'm not even going to keep going. They are supporting a rent to own program. Here is my thought on any rent to own program. Steve, shouldn't you read the rest of it first? I'm going to read the rest of it, but let's just hang on. Rent to own programs are BS. They never work. I've never seen one work. I've been selling real estate for almost 15 years here in Surrey, BC. I've never seen a successful rent to own. And there's many, many reasons for that. Uh, but in anybody talking about rent to own, this is already a waste of time topic, in my opinion. Under our plan, we will introduce a new rent to own program that will help it easier for renters to get path towards homeownership. We'll commit $1 billion. Now, you're going to hear this a lot, committing dollars. Remember this one thing, the government has no dollars. All they're doing is taking everyone else's dollars and dividing it around. So they're committing $1 billion of loans and grants to develop and scale a rent to own program not for profit under a typical rent to own program the individual commits to renting a property for a period of time with the option of buying uh, it at a locked in price later on we will design a program here we go landlords must commit to charging renters lower than market rate you can already see where this system is going to fail uh, the landlord must commit to ownership of at least five years. So you're going to commit an owner to not selling their own property. Already silly. Uh, proper safeguards will be in place to protect the future homeowner. Okay, so obviously you can see my, I'm going to skip over rent to own. I don't think that's a program that anyone will really benefit. So let's keep a going. Afford a down payment faster. We will introduce a tax-free first home savings account combining features of both the RRSP program and TFSA. Hey, I think this is great. If we can save money and have it be tax-free and then put it towards a home, I think this is something that's going to be good. The problem I have with this is... We already have tax-free savings accounts, so what does a different tax-free savings account gonna benefit? Well, maybe we can save up to $80,000 now. Uh, that might be a benefit. Next is more flexible first-time home buyer incentives. Incentives are, to me, a little bit of a joke, but that's all right. I mean, if we can get, first-time home buyers is where we should worry about getting people in. So I do agree, first-time home buyers is where the political parties should make it easier for Canadian citizen first timers to get into the market. So I tend to agree with them. So this is saying that they want to or that there is incentive programs to reduce monthly housing costs. Uh, basically, this is talking about the second mortgage type of situation that the government will take on and then become an owner in your property. So the reason I'm not in favor of that program when it was introduced, and it looks like they're going to expand it, uh, the government should not be buying into real estate because then they might do something like this. Oh, I don't know, for one reason or another, artificially turn down interest rates, causing prices to go up, therefore increasing the value that they get paid back for the people that use that program when they go to sell. Then there will also be an option, it looks like, to defer payments. I think deferring payments is the worst thing because all you're doing is kicking that can down the road. So is it gonna be more affordable that you can spend money other places in the economy? Sure. Is it going to make housing more affordable? I don't think so. Let's keep going here. Save on your closing costs as a home buyer. So I'm assuming this is going to be a tax credit. There we go. Uh, first time home buyers tax credit from five to ten thousand dollars, which will put uh, it's only a tax credit. So at best case scenario, fifteen hundred dollars back in your pocket. Should you qualify? Sure. Uh, tax credits are always wonderful, I guess. Uh, reduce your monthly mortgage costs when you need it most. Okay, so here, this one's basically talking about reducing CMHC fees. Uh, I mean, sure, I, I guess reducing CMHC fees is good. It's definitely going to help. So when if you don't know, uh, what happens with CMHC fees is that premium that gets uh, that you have to pay for gets put on top of your loan. So you actually are then paying interest on more money. So if they reduce that, 
I think that would be absolutely great. I can't, I don't know how much CMHC makes off of those in a given year. So I don't know if they have that in their budget to reduce the fee and then promise all these other dollars. But I do like this portion now with warehouse pricing uh, is going, we will increase the insured mortgage cutoff by a quarter million dollars. So I'm assuming what that means is you will be able to buy up to $1.25 million with less than 20% down. Uh, so I do like that idea because that's where house prices are going. However, if you're buying with less than 20% down, you're now going to cause house prices to go up. So again, uh, changing a lot of these policies actually will increase house prices over time, which I think are unfortunately very poorly thought out. Great intention, poor execution. Next up is give cities the tools they need to increase housing. Housing problems do a lot of the time come out of cities, not allowing building happening fast enough. Now I understand that we want to make sure everything's done safely and with permits, but for the fact that in say for instance the city of Vancouver, I think you're 18 months for permits to build a new property and that's just to like tear down one property and build a new house. I don't even want to know what it takes to do like a condo building or, or something like that. So if we can do anything, they're going to there we go, another $4 billion uh, for the Housing Acceleration Fund. Fantastic, I guess. Creating a targeted 100,000 new middle-class homes by 24-25. We will work with municipalities within the program, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so basically they're going to give cities money in order to try and speed up the process. So give more money to more governments, try and speed things up. My experience is that probably slows things down, but let's keep going to build and repair more affordable housing. Now, here's one thing I wish, before I read this, one thing I wish people would explain to me. When the government says we are going to build affordable housing, what does that mean? I mean, I'm in the business of selling houses and affordable housing built by the government is never anything I've understood or seen. So exactly what is it? Maybe this will tell us. Maybe I should shut up and, and listen. We will permanently increase funding to the National Housing Co-Investment Fund by a total of more, more money. Here we go. Um, more than double its current allocation. So they're going to increase money to the National Housing Co-Investment Fund. These extra funds will be dedicated to helping affordable housing providers acquire land. Uh, so they're going to help people buy more land, which is then apparently supposed to drive prices down. Again, may drive prices up, but they're going to focus towards volunteering with groups such as women, youth, and persons with disabilities. So fine. Here's a fun one. Convert empty office space into housing. Uh, this is how it's going to sound like a great idea. I think I actually saw this on either Dragon's Den or Shark Tank. Somebody tried to pitch uh, converting office space into housing and they were shot down by the dragons or sharks or whoever it was. Um, as the demand for retail and office space has changed due to COVID-19, so they're thinking very small in my opinion, uh, they are looking at vacancies. So there is opportunity for property owners and communities to explore, not do, explore, converting uh, excess space into rental housing. Okay, so they're going to try and figure out a way to make offices that are not being used into rental housing. This goes with the rent to own program. Maybe it's a great idea, um, but you know, so is communism in theory. Help different generations of a family live together. Let's see what this has to say. We will introduce a multi-generational home renovation tax credit. That's super interesting. Families will be able to claim 15% tax. Okay, so this is another tax credit up to $50,000 in renovations. This will provide up to $7,500 in support to help make communities more livable. So basically, multi-generational. When housing gets very expensive, generations do have to move in together. It's becoming very common for people to buy a house when their parents downsize what was going to be into a condo. They're now downsizing into the basement suite. So could this be good? Yeah. Do I think anybody will use it? No. Next one is supporting indigenous housing. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how the indigenous problem and the housing problem gets solved in this country, uh, given what's gone on with the indigenous people over hundreds of years. I don't understand this 
problem and I'm going to defer. So anything we can do in order to uh, lessen any of the problems that are going on in First Nations, I'm going to be in support of, but I don't know anything about it and I don't sell those types of properties, so I'm not going to comment. Uh, and chronic homelessness, well, good luck. Uh, should I even read this one? You're just going to end homelessness. Launch over 1,200 projects to work towards an end to uh, chronic homelessness. I mean, great, I guess. Uh, I don't think anybody has figured out exactly how to fix homelessness yet. Curb unproductive foreign ownership. So that is not curb foreign ownership, curb unproductive foreign ownership. So if you're productive and foreign will allow you, uh, if you're not productive and foreign, get the heck out of here. We will temporarily ban new foreign ownership in Canada, in housing. So not in or not in commercial, just in housing. To ensure Canadians have access, a temporary measure to help stabilize the housing market. Now, great. Um, you know, I'm kind of on board, I guess, with the idea of limiting home ownership. Uh, you, what they've done so far is just places like Toronto and Vancouver and most of BC, for that matter, have curbed uh, foreign ownership through immense, immense, big, big taxes, 20% on, you know, a million, two million bucks. Uh, uh, so it's actually fixed a lot of the problem. Do we need to suspend it completely? I mean, sure, I'll give you this one. Uh, I don't know that foreign owners are necessarily going to Moose Jaw or uh, Halifax and just buying up everything in sight, but okay. But let's keep going. They will ban for ban foreign money from purchasing a non-recreational residential property for the next two years, unless this purchase is confirmed to be for future employment or immigration. So what they're saying is if you're coming here and you're applying to work, uh, or if you want to move here, then this doesn't apply. But if you're not coming here and applying for, say, your PR or citizenship, I don't know, this is going to be a tough one to enforce. Um, I mean, they could just easily say, no, we're not going to allow any foreign owners whatsoever. And it would probably be a lot easier uh, thing to implement than this particular one. As outlined in the budget, we're implementing next year, Canada's first ever national tax, another tax, great, on non-residents, non-Canadians, owners of vacant or underused housing that will extend to foreign owned vacant land within large urban areas. So again, here, I think the idea behind this is great. Um, you know, do we need to open up land for use? Should it be owned by some offshore billionaires or big con conglomerate companies and just sitting there vacant? No, I can think of some places in Surrey that are like that, particularly one building up on 104 that if you're from Surrey, everybody knows about. It's been sitting there vacant for as long as I've been alive, I believe. But uh, how do you then regulate what they call here underused housing or underused land so do they want to look to expand this in the future to say you're not using your land effectively so now we're going to tax you if you so if you go back and look at the video i put up about vancouver taxing the air above a unit or above a restaurant uh that is where i can see this heading so as soon as the government comes to you and says you know you could be zoned here for a high rise, even though you are a single family home, we're going to tax you like a high rise, that can be a problem. Stop excessive profits. Excessive profits is an interesting term. Stop excessive profits in financial, financialization, finance, why can't I say that one? Finance, the financialization, easy for me to say, of housing. And let's see what that has to talk about. We will undertake a review of the tax treatment of large corporate owners of residential properties such as REITs. Okay, so they want to try and maybe crack down on REITs, which is uh, investment trusts who are trying to increase their rental housing, putting upward pressure on rent. Okay, so I'm going to straight up disagree with that statement. Anyone, a person investing for themselves or a company increasing rental stock does not put upward pressure on rents. What it does is it allows more rentals and then reduces rent costs because if there are enough rentals for everybody, there would be some vacancies and then prices would come down because landlords would need to fill their spots. So I'm going to suggest that that is an untrue statement and that increasing rental stock will actually bring 
prices of rents down. So again, this gets back to are we solving a solution uh, one way when really not having enough rentals is the problem. We will put in place policies to curb excessive profits in this area. In my mind, that says more tax while protecting small and independent landlords. Okay, maybe. So they're maybe now just talking just about corporate stuff. Uh, but how does that how is that going to get cut up? How many properties do you own? I'd be very interested to find out a home should be to live in not a financial asset for investment funds to be speculated on. If that statement is true, then make being a landlord illegal. That would solve a lot of our problems, right? Because if a home, like I, I am a landlord, and I do that to grow my own wealth. That's the reason, not because I just want to give someone a house. I do it to grow my own wealth for the future. So to say that we should not uh, be making financial uh, gains on investment properties is a ridiculous statement. <laughs> Steve, do you have anything nice to say? Okay, let's hop into strengthening federal oversight of the housing market. Great. We're talking about more regulation meaning more people talking about my industry and what I find, I'm going to be biased here. Like, how can I not be biased? I am a real estate agent. When the government gets involved in what real estate agents do, they don't consult real estate agents, so they don't know what they're changing. So let's, let's find out what they're changing. We will strengthen federal oversight on the housing market. We will establish Canadian financial crimes agency okay so they're gonna look into things i'm sure like money laundering i mean you're you're creating a new agency this is going to be more taxes for more people is money laundering a problem i believe so uh is it an issue through things like the casinos it may have been however when the casinos have been closed for all of covid and only opened up like last month here in bc house prices kept going up because of low interest rates. So uh, it's kind of silly, in my opinion, to, you know, to to blame the house pricing on things like financial crime at this point, even though I'm sure there is a lot of it. So they want to, again, crack down on money laundering in the housing market. If we can do that, I think that's great. We will increase the power of federal regulators to respond appropriately to housing price fluctuations to ensure a more stable housing market. To be fair, you already have that power. It's called interest rates. And I'm pretty sure that if we just turned up interest rates, the housing prices would come down. The only problem with that is it doesn't make them more affordable because your payment is the same. Okay, let's keep going. Reduce incentives for speculation and house flipping. Here we go. This is going to be directly involved now to what I do. We will establish an anti-flipping tax on residential properties, requiring properties to be held for at least 12 months. What? the heck the government is going to make sure you stay in your home for 12 months or they will tax you on the profits so what they're trying to do is stop house flipping now uh, here's the problem with that idea I, I think this is a diversion tactic myself flipping houses the profit that usually comes from flipping a house is not in the renovation done I know the tradesmen and all those guys like to think that that's the case usually the profit in any flip is when the market's going up. Like for instance, I personally bought a property uh, for about $475,000 in January. Currently, I wanna say market value is at least 550 on that property. So if I were to sell it today, uh, even if I put a new kitchen in, it wouldn't really matter. It's probably gonna sell for about the same amount. So it's the market going up. And again, the market going up is a result of low interest rates. So we're addressing in what my opinion is not an issue. Now, what I do think this is gonna do is this is gonna take away jobs because there are people that buy rundown houses, fix them up and sell them for profit. And that is their job. And they keep people like plumbers employed and they, I don't know, give money to Ikea for kitchens and they keep uh, electricians employed. So I don't know. Steve, how about you read the rest of it and get on with it? Good point. Okay. Uh, we will reduce speculative demand in the marketplace to help cool excessive price growth. Okay, so I do kind of agree with this. There are a lot of people looking to buy, say, a presale and make profit off of it. So 
if you haven't closed on the property, you know, you can't stop uh, contracts from being flipped because that's just contract law. It can't be changed. Um, however, I don't know. I do see the thought of people trying to make a quick buck by flipping properties intentionally and not doing anything like, for instance, pre-sales. I do see the thought behind trying to remove that. I'm not sure this is the right way to do it. Change of life circumstances due to, for example, pregnancy, death, employment, divorce, or disability will be exempt from the policy. So now you're going to try and, you know, hey, we bought a house. Uh, by the way, my spouse died and I can't afford the house. Apparently you're going to be exempt. I would suggest that a lot of people will within those, uh, for instance, it says here employment, uh, you could just either quit their job or say, I don't have an income. What if you're the guy flipping the house and you go, well, now I can't flip the house anymore because I don't have an income. I need to be able to sell it. I mean, maybe there's all sorts of loopholes that could be there. And then they say that you may be able to deduct legitimate investments from any of the tax that you would be subject to. So I'm going to go on board and say that that one is misguided. They've now taken people buying houses fixing them up, putting in the work and selling them for more money and lump them into speculation and trying to flip, say, for instance, pre-sales. And I think that's really misguided. Okay, and last and certainly probably not least, introduce a home buyer's bill of rights. That's not homeowner's bill of rights. That's not home seller's bill of rights. That's home buyer's bill of rights. So let's keep going here and see what this has. We will create a home buyer's bill of rights to make the home buying process more fair, open, and transparent. The sentiment here for sure is appreciated. Uh, home buying right now is intense and crazy for a lot of people, and they feel like they have no control over the situation. However, what I want you to remember, though, is home buying is 50% of the population. Home selling is the other 50%. So whatever gets introduced here is likely going to not benefit 50% of the population. Okay, so number one, banning blind bidding, which prevents bidders from knowing the bids from other buyers on your property and followed up with a false statement ultimately drives up home prices. I believe that statement is is false. I believe it's mostly false. It's not always false. It does happen where you will get some people shoot a really, really high offer in and it was way higher than the other offers, but that is their choice. So what they're proposing by saying this is they want all properties to essentially go to auction. So instead of knowing what you can afford and putting in an offer and then maybe getting beat or not beat, depend because you don't know what the other offers are, what they want to do is you have to be disclosed what all the other offers are. Now, in theory, what they're going to do is go, okay, well, I'm only going to pay a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks more than the last guy not driving prices up. However, have you ever been to an auction? Have you ever heard of the car auction called Barrett Jackson, where twenty-five dollars or $30,000 cars go to auctions, and then there's two or three rich guys sitting around, and they're like, yeah, I don't mind paying an extra three grand for that. I don't mind paying an extra five grand for that. And then the rich guys, at the end of the day, end up with all of the cars, and they may have paid, I don't know, a quarter million dollars for what should be a $50,000 car just because they were at an auction, they knew how much the other guy was willing to pay, so they were willing to pay more. The idea of taking away blind bidding is going to work just like that. Right now, you submit your offers. Uh, there might be kind of a, hey, you're close by, there's two offers, and we, we round out the details of those two offers that are closest, end up picking one, even if there's 35. But if we go to an open bidding system, it's gonna go a lot like this. You're going to submit your offer and all the other offers are going to come in. We're going to then know which one the highest offer is. Once that highest offer comes in, we as realtors will probably then go, okay, everybody, the highest offer is a million bucks. Who's willing to go to a million bucks and 1,000? Anybody? Oh, you'll go 1 million, 1,000? Anybody? Great. 1 million, 2,000. Anybody? Do I have 1 million, 2,000? Anybody? And this process is going to continue until somebody doesn't want to pay the money anymore. And I just think this is essentially going to actually do the reverse of what it's intended to do. Jeez, get on with it, Steve. All right, all right, I'll get on with it. Establish the legal right to a home inspection to make sure that buyers have peace of mind. 
again, this is going to be a very good thing for buyers. You have the right to get a home inspection. What I'm gathering this means, this is only my interpretation. There's going to be an accepted period of time where you get the accepted offer and then you can have a home inspection. But And this doesn't talk about your financing condition, nothing like that, just your home inspection. Or maybe the uh, seller will be obligated to let you have an inspector in prior to the offer presentation time. So here's what this does though. At the same time that you now get to have a home inspection regardless, no matter what, uh, it puts the other buyers who may be savvy enough or for instance have building uh, experience or are not worried about the home inspection, it now removes their ability to make their offer better without increasing the price. Often offers will get accepted if they don't have a home inspection, even if they're at a lower price, because the person with the home inspection may come back and try and renegotiate later, and the other guy doesn't have that opportunity. So sellers may actually accept that offer, and that's a better offer. Um, you know, again, is the idea here uh, a good one? I think the idea is, I don't think it's it's realistic. Um, and I think it's taking away your right to waive that. It's, it's almost becoming like a, a nanny state. To ensure total transparency on the history of recent house sale prices on the title searches. That is a big statement and I don't know what that means. On my current uh, backend system, as if you hire me as a realtor, I can tell you what that property sold for if it sold on and off market last time anyway. I can even tell you if somebody's done something on title and the property didn't sell, like remortgage. So I can see that stuff. I'm, I think that's kind of silly. Uh, I think what they're trying to get at is get more sales data out to other people and, or out to the public and well, yeah, that's that's a good thing. Now, I do have another opinion on that, and I'll share with you. One way you actually could slow down the market is what they do in the States, which is do not publish the sold price until the deal is actually closed. So right now, I can publish the sold price from the property I sold yesterday, even though it doesn't close for 90 days. If you held that information off of the system until the property closes and the money's in my client's pockets, now that process is going to be much longer which will actually slow down how fast prices rise. But what do I know? I'm just an expert. Okay, keep going here. Require real estate agents to disclose all participants in a transaction when they are involved in both sides. It doesn't apply here in BC because we're not involved in both sides. And I'm pretty sure that's almost a thing anyway. Everywhere else, you're going to know who everybody is. Moving forward with a publicly accessible beneficial ownership registry, we already have that here in BC. So you're behind the times. Federal government insuring banks and lenders offer mortgage deferrals up to six months in the event that you lose your job or have a major life event. What? You are going to allow people, no matter what, if they lose their job, to defer their mortgages. And this is going to bring house prices down. One way that house prices do come down is if banks foreclose because those properties usually go to market cheaper, bringing more stock to the market, therefore bringing down prices. And now you're gonna let people in their houses longer even if they cannot pay their bills. Now, again, the sentiment I feel for the individual is a very good sentiment for the public as a whole, causing house prices to go up yet again. Requiring mortgage lenders to act in your best interest so that you are fully informed. Yeah, okay, so yeah, um, sure. I think there should be more uh, information. My experience shows me though, a lot of people don't wanna be informed. They just wanna sign the paperwork. So more information is better. That's why you're here. That's why you're on the channel, right? As a part of establishing a home buyer's bill of rights, uh, a reelected liberal government will blah, blah, blah. And at the bottom here, they're gonna say they're gonna stop rent evictions and unfair rent increases that fall outside of the normal change in rent. Okay, so this is a topic in itself. If you stop people from evicting the tenants, renovating their unit, and then renting it for more money in the future or then selling it. The problem with that is they're just not going to renovate them. So you're going to have more dilapidated buildings over time. And then like, why would you put in more investment into the property as a landlord 
in order to just make it a nicer place for your tenant to still pay the same amount of rent. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So you're actually going to create slums as a result of stopping rent evictions. And I want to go back here really quick back to the blind bidding thing because there's something that I missed that I didn't really touch on. The federal government actually does not have regulation over real estate and how each province, I mean, that's how here in BC, we don't have uh, limited dual agency and every other province does still have limited dual agency because it's regulated at a provincial level, not at a federal level. So they can't actually bring in this blind bidding thing. So here's what the proposal really is. The proposal is to make it then illegal and a criminal offense for you, the seller, to not disclose all of the other offers by way of basically an auction. So they're not going to change uh, what I can do as a real estate agent or how the system works. What they're going to do is they're going to make it illegal for you, the home seller, to participate in a home sale unless it goes to auction. Or in this case, what they're calling transparent or open bids. So there you go. That's it. Uh, that is the whole platform. I am going to release another video on what I think of the other platforms. I'm not going to get into it as depth as this one. Uh, but I, I'm going to tell you, I don't think that this is any of this is going to bring home prices down. There are a couple of things and only really two things that are going to bring house prices down. One, we need more houses. OK, or let me let me stop that on the other side. Stop bringing people into the country. If we're going to increase and we have the same liberal platform is to increase from 250,000 people coming into our country each and every year to 400,000 you're going to now jam them into somewhere where there's no home. So unless you stop the people coming in and increase the housing, this problem is going to persist. The other thing that the federal government could do is increase interest rates and that will bring down housing. The trouble with that is they've got a whole bunch of debt now because they promised it to everybody. Uh, they promised a whole bunch of money to everybody. Uh, but the, the whole problem is they can't then service the debt if interest rates go up. But maybe I should be more open minded because I do think the best thing that has happened to our marketplace in a long, long time was actually something introduced by the Liberal government, which was the introduction of the stress test. It in itself is going to keep more people in more homes when interest rates go up. And I just hope they start increasing interest rates. The only trouble with that is your payments are not going to get any better. They're only going to get worse. So even though prices come down, you're going to get the same payment or higher. There you go. Comment below if you haven't already. I'd love it if you could subscribe to the channel. I will keep my next video much shorter than this one. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in a couple of days.